Good morning. What a joy it is to come together for worship again. And I am so thrilled and counted a privilege to do so with each of you this morning. I encourage you today that as we come together for worship, that as the praise and worship begins, just sing. Just lift your voices and your hands in praise and adoration of God. Show him just how much you love him and how much you want to sing praises to his name. And then as we open his word together, I pray that you would invite God through the truth and the power of his word to change you. And I'm doing the same. I'm asking him, God, just show me what's in me that needs to be different in order to be more like your son, Jesus Christ. I hope we can do that together and just seek his direction and guidance and filling of us with his presence and power today. As we begin our time together, won't you join me as we offer ourselves in worship to God? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be here in this time to praise you. God, thank you that worship is not limited to time or space or place. God, but instead that we can just praise you anywhere, any day, anyhow, anytime. We thank you for that, Lord God, that you are always there for us, always waiting and longing, Lord, for us to desire to be in your presence and to worship you. We were created to do just that, and I ask God that for each of us today, that's what we do, is to praise and adore you in worship today. Father, our hearts are heavy this weekend as we continue to think of the lives that were so senselessly taken on September 11th, those many years ago. God, all of us recall where we were in those moments and the feelings that came to spirit and heart and mind at the time and still do today. So God, we pray that you would just help all of those who lost loved ones in those tragedies. And God, I just I just pray that you would continue to, to reign supreme as God Almighty. Father, when we see this level of evil in our world, it just breaks our hearts. And I pray that we can rise up and be the very church of God that you've created us to be, to share and to live out the love of Jesus Christ so that others will see you, see you in us, Lord God. And help us as a community of faith to be that kind of movement of God that demonstrates for the world around us what a people united in heart and spirit and in purpose for you can do in your power and in your strength and in your leading. God, we commit ourselves to you yet again this day. We ask God that you take us and use us. And I pray, God, that this time of worship would bring honor and glory to you and to you alone. We ask it all, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Savior.
Christine Kane has said these words, God has chosen you. God has anointed you. God has empowered you to do everything that he has called you to do. So fix your eyes on Jesus, not on others, not on your mistakes, not on your past, not on your disappointments, not on your fears, not on your failures, and not on your regrets. God is the author and the finisher of our faith. He who has promised is faithful. Christine Kane. You may say, well, that's just fine, Johnny. I long to do what it is that God has called me to do. I long to better understand exactly, specifically, what it is that he has empowered and equipped and prepared me to do. I would love to do just that, but I am just so frustrated in these days that we are living in. There are so many hurdles and challenges and threats and difficulties, and I am just so sick and tired of all that's been going on. This year has been wild and crazy, and I just need a little peace in my life so that I can better focus on what it is that God desires me to do. Because in the midst of all of this, I just can't even focus. And the truth of the matter is, we really need God to unleash his strength in us, don't we? So that we can do what it is that he has called and anointed and equipped and empowered us to do. I know that I need that in my life, whether it's in a rather routine season of life or it is if it is in one of these tumultuous seasons that perhaps you, I know I am experiencing in these days. Last week we began a time of studying together and we'll continue over the next several weeks studying about how God unleashes his power in us, where he will just let out what has already been planted inside of us, his Holy Spirit's power, to turn him loose, such that we stop restraining and holding him back and instead give the Holy Spirit the space, give his power the space to do what he was created to do in us in the first place. Today, I would like us to take a look together at the prophet Elijah and how it is that he embraced the unleashed power of God in him. And we enter into the history of God's chosen people, the Israelites, when they were a divided kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, at this point in their history, King Ahab was the king of the northern kingdom kingdom of Israel, and his wife was Queen Jezebel. Just saying the name brings a little heartburn to mind, doesn't it? Queen Jezebel. Uh, our first introduction to Ahab in the scripture is this. This is what the text says about him. He was more evil than all of the kings who had gone before him. He angered more, God more than all of the other kings that were before him. This is quite a couple, Ahab and Jezebel. And enter Elijah on a mission of God to help Ahab somehow see and understand the evil of his ways. And Elijah, through God's direction and guidance and calling and mission, he declares to Ahab that there will be a drought. There will be a drought in the land for weeks, months, for years. Whatever it takes, wherever God leads, no rain. And Ahab is quite, quite angry. As a result of this, Ahab turns to his gods of Baal. 
this false god Baal with all his little minion gods and all the prophets that support Baal. And he turns to Baal begging and pleading for help in this drought. Elijah says, that's not going to do you any good. He's, he's of no comparison. He can't do anything. Our God, Almighty God, the one and only God, is the only God that can do something about this. You need to turn your allegiance to him. And what we see then that comes is this showdown between Elijah, the prophet of Almighty God, versus this host of prophets of Baal. This account is, is given to us in 1 Kings chapter 18, and I really strongly encourage you to read this. This is an amazing, wonderful story, one of my all-time favorites. You just have to love it, and it just demonstrates the power, the unbelievable power of God. You have this multitude of prophets of Baal, and you have Elijah pitted against each other, and each of them is going to offer up a sacrifice, a burnt offering to their God. And in doing so, just suffice it to say that there is this, this showdown between them and Almighty God wins, of course, through the prophet Elijah. He was greatly, greatly outnumbered and in a worldly sense outpowered, but God, but God, we know, is always in control and in power and he wins. And as a result of that, all of the prophets of Baal were then taken away and murdered. And Elijah pronounces an end to the lengthy drought. And that's where we pick up the story this morning in 1 Kings chapter 19. And we'll read together there the first 15 verses. I encourage you to please follow along in your, um, your scripture on your devices or within your Bibles or watch the words along the screen before you this morning. 1 Kings chapter 19, the first 15 verses there. And here we read. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah has, had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid, and he got up and he fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly, an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank, and he lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, Get up and eat. Otherwise, the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank, and then he went in the strength of that food, 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. At that place, he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he answered, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now, there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? 
And he answered, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. And then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aram. Powerful words of God, an amazing story. <clears throat> queen Jezebel hears about the prophets of Baal being killed. Whether it's her threat or her promise, she makes it real clear to Elijah, you're going down. If you don't go down, I'm going down, she says. So let's suffice it to say, you're the one going down. And with this threat, Elijah is just at the end of his rope. He's worn out. He's burned out. He's exhausted. He's vulnerable. And Elijah, who had been so very strong, suddenly crumbles with fear. He's in a state of despair, and he takes flight, and he goes a very long distance. He goes to this place of Beersheba, which is the southernmost point of the southern kingdom. So he gets to a place that is the southernmost, the farthest place that he can go to in the civilized nations of the children of God. He leaves a servant there and then takes another day's journey out into the wilderness. And he gets there and he just cries out to God. And he says, God, I'm done. I'm done. I've had enough. Just take me now. Take me now. I just wish I were dead. You know, is, is, is Elijah having some sort of midlife crisis here? He's clearly, clearly in a state before God. He falls asleep there. And an angel comes along and nudges him awake and says, Elijah, get up, eat. Elijah awakes from, from his sleepiness. He looks around and there's food and water right there, miraculously provided of God for him. And he eats and he drinks and falls asleep again. The angel nudges him a second time and says, Elijah, get up and eat. You need this food for the journey that you're about to take. So he does. He eats. He drinks. The angel sends him on a 40-day journey. He arrives at a cave on Mount Horeb, another name for Mount Sinai, which we may, may be more familiar with. And there, at this cave on the mount, God appears to Elijah. And the, the voice of God says, Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah vents to God. He says, look, I did everything right. I did everything right. I did exactly what you told me to do. And then they went out and they, they, they killed all your other prophets, all the other prophets of Almighty God. They have killed your children, the Israelites. Now, I'm the only one that's left. I am all alone, and they're trying to kill me. Elijah's having this sort of self-pity party, isn't he? God says, Elijah, step out of the cave. Watch for me. Look for me. Suddenly, there is this mighty rushing wind. The rocks on the mountain are actually splitting in two and rolling off the mountain. And Elijah's back in the cave, yet peeking out, looking for God, and there's no God in the wind. Suddenly, he senses the, the ground beneath him starting to rumble and tremble, and he looks, and there, there's this earthquake that has come about, and, and he's looking all around, where's God, where's God, and there's no God in the earthquake. Out of nowhere, through the providence and power of God, a fire erupts. And, and again, I, I presume Elijah is somewhat backing away and yet at the same time intrigued and longing to see God in the midst of the fire. But still, no God. And after the fire, all calms down. And there is the sound of sheer silence. <laughs> And it is in that silence that Elijah, he hears the, the whisper of God. And Elijah comes back out of that cave, back out into the open, and there God says to him again, Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah comes back again with the same response. You know, those, those, those people in the in Israel, they, they came after all of your prophets. They killed them all. I'm the only one that's left. It's just me. And now Jezebel is out to get me too. Please, God. And God says to Elijah, he says, go. 
you've got work to do for me. And Elijah goes. He goes in the strength, the power of God unleashed in him. I'd like us to, to look at some four life truths that we can glean from this facet of Elijah's life story. And the first one is this. Oh, how the mighty can fall. Oh, how far the mighty can fall. I mean, here we've got God's prophet, Elijah. He has stood against this multitude of prophets that, that somehow give their allegiances to the false god Baal. He is greatly outnumbered. He's outpowered in the worldly ways, if you will. The king and the queen are standing on the side of the prophets of Baal. And there is lonely Elijah all by himself standing against them. They have this showdown and God proves himself in control and all powerful in the worldly sense, in the eyes and the minds of Ahab and Jezebel, Elijah won the showdown. He was victorious. He was the one that came out the victor in all of this. And then Jezebel, the queen, threatens him. And, and he, he goes all weak at the knees, scared to death, trembling in his boots. And off he runs in fear, in flight, running from Queen Jezebel. You and I, we can sincerely follow God, can't we? And in that process of truly and honestly following and doing for him, we too can get worn out as Elijah did. We can get burned out and exhausted doing all the right things in all the right ways for God, for God. We can go down in exhaustion, can't we? Now, I'm going to just personally confess to you that I am the worst at this. I am so bad. I can push and push and push and keep thinking this has got to get done and that's got to get done and it has to be done this way today and so on and so forth to the point that I can just drive myself to a place that I don't need to be. And I can tell you right now, the cheers from my wife and family are deafening at the moment because they know this to be true of me. I'm guessing that it can be true of you to some degree as well. We can get worn out doing all the great mission projects and ministries and callings of God that he has placed before us if we're not careful. If we neglect our physical and our emotional health if we neglect that communing in solitude with God, then we are going down. When we neglect those things, neglect our physical self, our emotional state, when we neglect time alone with God, we lack and lose our focus. We lack strength. We lack the Holy Spirit's power unleashed in us. We lack the spiritual discernment and judgment that we need in order to accomplish what it is that he has set before us to accomplish we lack discipline in being just so in communion with God. We lack good, godly judgment, and it leads us to extreme behaviors, much the way it led to Elijah in his extreme behaviors of running, running away from this, this threat that really wasn't the kind of threat that he per perceived it to be. The beauty of it is, though, God knows us better than anyone, of course. He knows our limitations. And he knows that this sense of, of depletion within our physical and emotional bodies and within our spirits, that it's real and can have devastating effects upon us. When was the last time that God asked you, Johnny, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? I find myself guilty in knowing that God is asking me the question, Johnny, what are you doing here yet again? Another time, haven't we been over this before? Twice God asks Elijah, what are you doing here? 
When is God last to ask you, what are you doing here? What are you doing here in this place, in this place that is unhealthy for you, in this place that has uh, things going on and temptations taking place? What are you doing in this video yet again? What are you doing here listening to this music? What are you doing here watching this on Netflix? What are you doing in this geography, this place, this space that is not God-honoring and healthy for you? God asks us, what are you doing here surrounded by these people who are toxic to you? Of course, we want them to come to know Jesus Christ and surrender their lives to them. But sometimes when we are in a weakened state, that's the last group of people that we might need to be around until we can get that power of God re-unleashed in us yet again to be strong enough to deal with what we might be up against. What are you doing here amongst the people that are pulling you down and sucking the very life out of you? Why are you here? Sometimes God asks us, why are you here? What are you doing here in this state of mind, this state of depression, this state of doubt, this place of wondering and questioning and, and asking all these whys and, and fearful of stepping out because you can't see the destination, you can't see the end point of the journey. You're, you're, you're hesitant to do what it is that God himself has called us to do because we're just sitting here wondering, am I really up to the challenge can I really do this? We listen to the enemy, but we're not listening to God. He says, what are you doing here? I give you your mission. I give you your calling. I give you your anointing, your empowerment. I give you life value. Listen to me. Why are you in this state of questioning? God asks us, what are you doing here? Or you're neglecting yourself physically such that you are not in the best possible physical shape to do what I've called you to do. What are you doing here in this undisciplined spiritual state? Yet again, we've gone over this many times in the past. You need to be in the Word. You need to be in a community of faith-filled believers that seek Him, not just doing ministry, not just socializing with one another, not just wanting to hang out with their friends, but wanting to be on their knees and faces before God, seeking his direction and longing for him to use us as the family of God, as a movement of God in this community, so that his love is seen and evidenced in us such that he changes people's lives through his church. What are you doing here instead of there? What are you doing here, God asks us, that you are so encumbered by your worldly possessions and your worldly obligations that you're unable to freely step out in faith, in freedom, on the journey that I've placed before you to answer the calling that I've set before you. You can't go where I've called you to go if you're shackled to where you are now. God has so much more in store for us. And he's asking us, what are you doing here? We need his power unleashed in us, don't we? So that we can go where he calls us to go, to be who he calls us to be. A second life truth that we glean from Elisha today is that we all need sustenance and rest. We desperately need sustenance and rest. The, the ever-cherished Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. We need that, don't we? And sometimes God says, if you're not going to take care of it on your own, then I'm going to make you to lie down. I'm going to make you rest and get that, that healthy diet and that, that sense of restoration and replenishment of, of physical body and mind that you need. These past six months, God has put us on pause to some degree. Some are, are working harder and longer than before, but yet there is still some facets of our life that seem to be on hold. God has given us opportunities to get 
that rest. We need it. And many of you might say, well, gosh, Johnny, yeah, thanks to COVID, that's all I've done is sit around and sleep and eat for, for weeks on end. But I, I would ask you why? Why? Because there's nothing else to do and you're bored? Because the medical experts said this is what we're supposed to do and you're following the rules? I mean, with your extra time and rest these past several months, have they taken you intentionally deeper in a personal relationship to God? Have you gotten closer to him on purpose in these times and with purpose in these times? Has this extra time and this rest, has it given you a better focus on his next mission, his next calling for your life? Are you looking for what it is that God is showing you or attempting to show you and I as to where we go, what we do next? With this extra time of rest and, and time alone, have we sensed his preparing us for what that next mission is? Have you, have you grasped that God is doing something in you to get you ready and equipped for his next calling? In these times, I hope and pray because I've been longing for this myself, for a deeper sense of humility before God, a, a greater, grander, more clear dependence upon him, a sincere and growing faith, because I've had more time alone with him to grasp how beautiful, how wonderful he is. Elijah shows us this and another third life truth, if you will, that we need not just the physical and mental sustenance, but we need the, the solitude with God because our spirit, our spirit, the, our soul needs feeding and our soul needs rest. Elijah was in the cave and, and, and it was in this, this time of, of wilderness in the cave that, that he finally found a way to hear the whisper, the voice of God in the silence. Throughout the gospel accounts, we see Jesus leaving the crowds, leaving his, his beautiful friends, the disciples, to get on, alone, whether on a mountain or someplace in a garden, alone in solitude with his heavenly Father. If it was right for Jesus, then it has to be right for you and I. Our wilderness experiences are vital. They are vital to our spiritual growth. They are vital to you and I becoming faith-filled, totally surrendered, fully dependent upon God, followers of Christ. That's what we need. And so therefore we need this solitude, this wilderness experience with God. It's hard, isn't it, to fully experience God, to hear his voice, to sense his leading and prompting in the screaming loudness of the worldly drama that's all around us, so often suffocating us, and it just drowns out that whisper of God. We need his power unleashed in us that drives us to that place to where we can find that quiet solitude alone, communing with God. And fourthly, we see from Elijah that it is only then only then, after we've been in the cave and been alone with God and found that way to hear his voice, it is then that we get the next calling of God. It is then that God shows us and directs us as to, this is what I want for you and from you. This is where I want you to go and be, be my presence to those that need me. Matt Chandler said, maybe you're just not tired enough to fully surrender your life to Christ and trust him. He was saying basically that sometimes you and I, and I'll speak for myself here, maybe I just get a little too hard-headed with God sometimes that I need to get to a place where everything else seems to be pulled away, to where I feel like the, the, the rug has been yanked out from under me, to where despite all my my best efforts to accomplish things and to do things with purpose and to do the right things for God, I get to a place where 
It all just seems so futile and I recognize and I kick myself yet again and say, oh God, I confess, I am so sorry. I'm trying to do this in my strength instead of yours and I'm just so sick and I'm so tired and so worn out from all of this and I know that what I need to do is just depend upon you and you alone. Folks, friends, sometimes we just need to refocus the sick and tired that comes upon us because of job or family or finances or whatever the challenges are that are coming your way. And we need to refocus that sick and tired and that complaining to God into asking God, what is it that you're trying to do in me in this tired state that I find myself in? In this place, God, where I am so worn out, just like Elijah was, how is it that you are trying to unleash your power in me? God, what's next for me? You know, the truth is this. Sometimes his unleashed power in you and I, it's a lot more practical than we give God credit for. It's a lot more simple, more common sense, even a bit more subtle and quiet more so than the, the supernatural that we long for, this super spiritual God has given us, this, this burning bush, this lightning bolt, this earth-shattering, monumental, deeply theological revelation of himself. Sometimes God just makes it quieter and easier, you know? He says, you don't need a hurricane or an earthquake. You don't need a fire you just need to be still and quiet and listen. You know, sometimes God's power unleashed in us is a little more like mom's advice. Son, get some rest. You're worn out. You pushed yourself too hard again. Get some sleep. Daughter, eat something. Eat something healthy. Eat something that's going to make you feel better. Take care of yourself. Sometimes that, that power unleashed is God's whisper just calling us to say, get along with me. It's been too long since you opened up my word and we just spent some time together in the quiet, in the stillness, to where you can hear the sound of sheer silence and open up your mind and your heart and your spirit for what's next. A question that comes to mind in, in the midst here of Elijah's story, he has this encounter with God. So often God works through other people in our lives to, to bring us to this same place. And so I would ask you, I know the answer to this question for my life, but I want to ask you too today to be honest with yourself. Who's your tough love? Who's that person in your life that just rocks your world when you find yourself in that place where Elijah was? Who is that person that acts as, as that tough love for you? As God asked Elijah, who is that person that asks you, what are you doing here? Why are you in this place yet again? Why are you here? Who is that person that speaks honest and loving truth to you? Who is that person that just kicks you right back into focus and gets you into that right place with God? Who is that person in your life that asks you over and again, despite perhaps the awkwardness or the discomfort of it all, that says, what are you doing here. <laughs> Have you told that person thank you lately? Hmm. I know for me, there's one or two people in my life, over the course of my life, that, that have done so, and I am so deeply indebted to them. I am so incredibly grateful that God has given me the gift of a loving wife who doesn't hesitate for a moment to ask me, what are you doing here? and to help me to refocus myself back to where I need to be, 
to be pleasing to God, to be a better follower of Christ, to be a better husband and father and son. Tell them thank you for getting you back into refocused attention of God yet again. They deserve our gratitude. When I was growing up, Sundays for my family were all very, very predictable. We'd get up in the morning and there was the usual morning routine of breakfast and getting dressed and we were going to church. Heaven help you if you thought for a moment that you were going to take today off from church and stay home instead and just do whatever you thought you might would like to do because you were either going to a hospital because you were in dire need of emergency care or you were going to church. That's what we did. We come home from church and there would be a, a shared meal around the table and then changing of clothes and off we go to visit family. So often we go see the grandparents. Uh, the grandparents lived with an aunt and uncle and so there were cousins there and it was a I, I, it was a great time and I just cherish memories. I can just visualize them in my mind as I think about them. Um, we spent a lot of time on the river where I grew up and lots of fun Sunday afternoons on the water, just relaxing, swimming, boating, rafting, water skiing, you name it, and just enjoying the, the sunset and so forth as the, the weekend came to a close. Sundays were a true sense of Sabbath for my family growing up, and I praise God for it, and I thank my parents for it, for raising us in that way. Sabbath. We need God's Sabbath, don't we? In Hebrews, the fourth chapter, beginning at verse 9, we read these words, So then, a Sabbath rest still remains for the people of God. For those who enter God's rest also cease from their labors, as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one may fall through such disobedience as theirs. <laughs> Getting worn out, sick and tired can bring on the disobedience, can it? We need Sabbath rest. And it is in that Sabbath rest that God unleashes his power in us. So don't be sick and tired today. Wherever you are in whatever state of life you find yourself in today, he unleashes his power in you and me when we get to that place of quiet rest, sustenance, solitude alone with him. And that Sabbath rest, that power unleashed, makes you and I ready for all the more, all the more, the excitement, the adventure, all the more that he has for us. Let him unleash his power in you today. Be still and quiet. Take mom's advice. Be alone with him. Why don't you pray with me? Oh, loving Father, how we thank you and praise you that you are right here for us each and every day and every step of the way. Father, I pray for all of us. God, that you would just let us hear that still, quiet voice. Father, let us get the rest that you require of us and that you long for us to have. That Let us, Lord God, do the things that care for our physical selves that care for our minds, that will keep us in healthy living and, and healthy thoughts, Lord God. Father, I pray that we would, in, in those days, each and every day, find ourselves in a place where we go to the cave, we, we go to the quiet, to the closet, to the corner of the room, that special place where we can be alone in solitude and communing with you. Lord, I pray that you would just call us unto yourself. And Father, as we do these things, as we put our lives on whatever hold we need to, to let go of the, the shackles and the baggage that holds us back from fully serving you, Lord God, let us, let us care for self in ways that honor you. Let us get the rest. Let us get the healthy sustenance that we need. Let us get the aloneness with you to hear your voice so that we can embrace 
your power unleashed in us to equip us and prepare us, to anoint us and to direct us to what's next, to what you're doing in us, showing us so that we are ready for the more that you have in store for us to fulfill the calling that you've laid out there for us. God, use us, I pray. Use us as your servants. Use us as your church, your family of faith in this place to make your ways known to this community and beyond so that the glory of God is declared and seen and lived out in all. Thank you, God. Thank you that in the quiet, you speak and you make yourself and your power known and unleashed. Thank you for being our God. We cherish you as our Father. And we give ourselves to you, Lord God, and surrender in the name of our loving and living Savior, Jesus Christ. 